Hello everyone and welcome to another Conan Exiles castle building tutorial. This time around I'll be making a good old European concentric castle. The definition of a concentric castle is very broad. As long as there are at least two full rings of curtain walls, one inside the other, the castle is considered a concentric one. Historical examples will therefore vary greatly. The beauty of a concentric design lies in its adaptability. It is completely terrain agnostic, but can take advantage of it. This often resulted in symmetrical castles, built on flat terrain like Bomoris castles in Wales. In other places, where the terrain offered some advantage, exposed walls were often strengthened, as is the case with Crack de Chevalier in Syria. This is the basic plan for the castle. Outer grey ring will become curtain wall. The lighter, middle ring is extremely reduced outer bailey and the remaining space inside will be taken by the inner bailey, its walls and keep. I've made the outline by connecting 10 towers together. This gives me two rectangles with three triangles attached to the sides. It is extremely important to form equilateral triangles or the floor tiles won't fill up the shape. To scale along the x-axis, simply resize the rectangles. Y-scaling is a different matter for this design. Either scale the triangles or change their number. In both cases you'll have to modify the rectangles to accommodate the towers forming the triangles vertices. If you've watched my immersive base building tutorial, this shape should look very familiar. In fact, this is the universal castle building block and the outline of this castle is built with slightly more advanced version of connect the dots method. If you're new to the channel, consider watching the tutorial, or at least part 4. Here's a quick recap. The towers are built with inner core of 6 wedge foundations, surrounded by a ring of alternating squares and wedges. Then, they are connected with lines of square foundations. This creates a geometric shape with the towers as vertices and edges made of square foundations. The thing with this castle is, the triangles forming the sides will be filled with just wedge foundations and it'll only work if the general shape is that of equilateral triangle. Simply put, each connection between the towers on the sides must be the same length. Seven blocks in this case. Filling up the rectangular part is simple. A single line of wedge foundations along the edges will square everything up nicely so that the remaining space can be filled with square foundations. The regular way in and out of this castle will be really long and after a few trips will become a bother, so I'm making a secret entrance here. For now, it's just a simple passage through the wall. The arena set which I'm using for this castle comes with two variations for each foundation. The sand-covered ones will form the outer bailey, reduced to just a narrow passage. This is not always the case with concentric castles. Some had regular, large and open outer baileys with various buildings, while others only had a simple passage running from outer to inner gates. Its level in relation to outer wall mostly dependent on the shape of the terrain below. Since I really wanted a water-filled mode this time, I had to build underwater. Usually a case like this would be placed on a little hill, in which case you won't even have to create this passage. Simply leave some space between outer and inner curtain wall. This would also simplify a lot of things since you'd be able to build various parts of the castle as independent buildings. Not to mention the absurd number of foundations required for this. If you want to try building this, Try replacing most of the foundations inside with the basic sandstone ones, or even leaving some out, as long as you make sure that there's enough stability for the castle above. So, a couple thousand clicks later the level 0 is done. I've left some water showing through near the secret entrance, I'll deal with it later. I need some way to cross the water and enter the castle. A drawbridge is an obvious solution. First I make sure to leave 3 blocks wide space for the gate, then I attach the drawbridge. In order to line up the landing, I'm going to place some throwaway blocks. Just don't use high tier tiles for this like I'm doing here. I'm in admin mode, so I have infinite resources. 
The spot I've chosen for entrance is the tip of a very thin peninsula, which is naturally a defensive position. Also, it lies along the longer wall of the castle, so any enemy approaching the gate will have to walk along this thin strip of land, devoid of any cover, while being shot at from both the outer and inner walls. Later on, I'll add a small barbican to make approaching the drawbridge even harder. This seems to work well. Now, for the other side. I've added another set of gates. This gives me some additional protection and makes some space in between the gates that's perfect for a murder hole. I want to keep the inner passage low to maintain the height advantage of both inner and outer walls. So I've created a small platform and stairs leading down just beyond the gates. These are Turanian ones. I couldn't use arena stairs here because they require a square underneath. I've built the outer wall to its full height of 3 blocks before starting work on the gatehouse. This allowed me to use the walls as a visual guide for judging proper height and size of the gate tower and made obvious any places that required strengthening. I've kept all the other towers the same height as the wall. In designs like this, higher towers would actually compromise the castle's defenses. Let me explain. The basic idea behind every castle ever built is to make the fight as unfair as possible. That is, give advantage to the defenders and make every victory pyrrhic for the attackers. A high tower on the outer wall could be used to engage the defenders of the inner castle, while a low one is useless for that purpose while maintaining its basic function. It still is a structural reinforcement for the walls which is important in real life, not so much in game, and it still allows flanking fire against the troops trying to climb the walls. I want to keep the outer gatehouse small and simple. Just like the walls, I don't want to make it a viable platform to attack the inner keep. The rooms are small and have mostly triangular floor tiles, which makes placing stairs a bit awkward, so I've decided to put them outside. I'm making these rooms a single block high for a very specific reason. What I'm trying to do is capture the claustrophobic feel of the real thing. Despite the huge external dimensions, rooms and passages inside the castle, especially in the purely defensive parts, were quite small. The reason for this was very simple. The walls were extremely thick. I've chosen the stable tiles for the floor. The color and simplicity of this wooden floor meshes well with the arena walls, and as a bonus, is actually quite realistic. This kind of structure, the weight was carried by the outer walls made of stone. The floors were made by either building a vaulted ceiling, which was usually done on the lowest levels, or by placing wooden beams, spanning the whole interior and supporting the wooden floor. Oak was the preferred material for this, but even the strongest wooden floors couldn't stand the test of time, hence in most ruins today only empty stone shells of towers and other buildings remain. I've used stone arena tiles for the roof, mostly because I didn't want the wooden floor to give away the true thickness of the walls. It's not completely unrealistic though. Sometimes a wooden roof would be reinforced or covered with other material like stone, gravel or tiles, mostly for fireproofing. As for the defensive features, I've made some openings for archers inside the gate and left some holes in the top floor as a nod to the proper machiculations of the real castles. Finally, I've placed some siege cauldrons above the gate to pour boiling water on anyone below. Despite the popular belief, oil was not used for this. Basically, it was way too expensive and useful for other purposes, while water was abundant and worked just as well. I've used wedge tiles to create machiculations around the whole castle. If you'd like, you can build a proper crenellation by alternating walls and fences, or keep it simple like I did. As a bonus, the machiculations created this nice shadow pattern on the walls, making them look a little less boring. One important thing, the defensive features should be facing outside only. The reason will become clear in a minute. The inner bay will be accessible via gatekeep on the opposite side of the castle. The first row of wedge foundations is just temporary. For some reason the game wouldn't let me snap the gate the way I wanted without it. The gatekeep protecting the inner bailey will be substantially larger than the first one. 
so the inner gate is a few tiles away. This will create a nice little kill zone in between. On the topic of kill zones, here is a way bigger one. I've encircled the inner bailey area with a single row of foundations for now to show you the biggest advantage of this design. Should the attackers break through the outer gates, they'll have to move to the other side of the castle via this narrow passage, with defenders manning the walls on both sides. And should they make it, they can now capture the outer wall, which actually gives them nothing, because now they have even higher inner wall in front of them, with the outer bailey becoming a moat of sorts. Also, they are completely open and vulnerable because the outer walls have no battlements facing inside to provide cover. To actually connect both gates with the outer bailey passage, I've gradually elevated it. Its final height is just a single block lower than the walls. I'm using arena and Turanian stairs here, depending on the type of foundation below. Arena on squares and Turanian on wedges. I want to completely separate the walls, so the passage leads to the outer wall and ends there. The only way to reach inner keep will be via drawbridge. For this reason I've left the gap in front of the gate. After I remove the temporary blocks and fill it with spikes, it will become a mini moat protecting the inner keep. As an alternative I could simply remove some foundations here and make it waterfield moat as well, but I just wanted a spike trap. Every castle should have one. Before moving on to Upper Bailey, I had to decide what to do with all the empty space below. Normally a castle like this would be built on a mellow hill, so most of this space wouldn't be accessible, but since I've decided to build it on water, I can place some stuff here. The waterfield part will become a cistern and escape route later on. The rest I roughly divided and placed animal pen and map room in two separate rooms since these two are always hard to fit anywhere due to their size. Since I've decided to make use of that space, now I need access points. Elephants and crocs walking up and down a narrow set of stairs would be a little bit weird, so I've decided to make a large entrance on the lowest level, which will lead to the beast pens. The map room and cistern will be both accessible via the elevator from the main keep, and the cistern will also have a regular staircase. I've covered this passage with vaulted ceilings except for the last block. This will be the bottom of the elevator shaft, which will connect my respawn point to both map room and quick exit. On a side note, little corridors with vaulted ceilings like this are the coolest thing ever. They immediately take me back to the early 90s and classics like Eye of the Beholder or Dungeon Master. The vaulted ceilings that came with Blood on the Sand DLC opened so many possibilities for recreating medieval and ancient buildings. All manner of proper vaulted ceilings for great halls or dungeons are now possible. But I want to further exploit the fact that there's water underneath my castle, and I've decided to build a little homage to the stunning Basilica Cistern, built 15 centuries ago in the city of Constantinopolis, a once small Greek colony called Byzantion that became capital of the Great Empire. It survived till present day, so if you're in Istanbul, as it's known today, it should be on your list right after Hagia Sophia. The item in the third slot of my quick bar allows me to place off-center columns. It's from a mod called Glass Constructions and More. My full mod list is, as always, in the description. I've decided to divide the remaining space roughly into two parts and fill the center underneath the gatehouse. The remaining triangular rooms are completely separate. One can be entered via the staircase that leads to the cistern, while the other will be accessible through the gatekeep itself. As for the beast pens and map room, I filled as much space as I reasonably could with foundations and placed a lot of pillars around them. Generally I don't like having a huge open space beneath my castles, especially when the walls are not directly above each other. This almost inevitably creates stability issues later on. As a general rule on stability, you do not lose stability going up, but you can only place 4 tiles horizontally. 
Now with this large flat surface it is easy to lose track of tiles that are actually foundations connected to the ground and which are just ceilings. Unless you use some other tile set. Some of them have actually different textures for foundations and ceilings. So anyway, it's possible to build a new structure that's actually standing mostly on air. And the issue will become visible at the very end, as you won't be able to place roof tiles in some areas. The solution is simple but sometimes awkward to implement. Use pillars to get additional support and make sure that they go all the way down to the ground level or foundations attached to it. Just like in the first gatehouse, I want the interiors to fill in a certain way, mostly small, cramped and heavy, while at the same time they should emphasize the strength and thickness of the walls. For that reason I'm making the rooms very irregular. The shape should feel like it's a secondary consideration for the architect, whose primary goal was to make the wall structurally sound. And I'm using wedge foundations to make these alcoves with windows in the middle to actually show the thickness of the walls. Inside the gatehouse I again use the stable tiles for the floor to keep the interiors of the two gatehouses consistent. If your goal is to make a realistic looking place, consistency is the key. What I try to do is imagine how the whole building process would look like, what makes sense and what does not. For example, the warm tan color of arena tile stone meshes well with the desert around the castle. This makes it feel like it belongs here, which makes sense as the castle would be built with locally available material. On the other hand, if I was building a luxurious estate here, I'd use the Aquilonian tiles. Their bright, almost white color clashing with the surroundings would immediately make the building stand out. And it also makes sense, as the owner would import exotic marble to show off his wealth. Basically, choose a theme and stick with it. Keep in mind though, that the master strike that truly brings your build to life is usually a skillfully done inconsistent element. Contrast is a spotlight, while consistency is the mastery of the background. Now for the defensive features. First of all, the gatehouse is only accessible from the inner bailey. The space between the drawbridge and the inner gate is a kill zone, flanked by open galleries for archers on both sides and the ceiling is full of murder holes. Finally, the outside walls are all equipped with much collations, which is just a fancy word for a hole in the part of the floor that hangs beyond the face of the wall. One thing though, the open gallery is not really a thing you'd encounter in a real castle. There would be a solid wall in its place, pierced with arrow loops, which allow the defenders to engage the targets trapped in the kill zone from relative safety. The sad truth is, when it comes to defensive features, Funcom dropped the ball. Basically, there are two types of defenses, passive and active. Passive would include walls, modes and overall design. In a game where you can swim and climb vertical walls wearing a full set of armor or throw magical jars that are more powerful than modern high explosives, all of these defenses fail by default. Active defenses are designed to provide some advantage to soldiers manning them. This would include at least proper crenellation, arrow loops, murder holes and much collations. Fancom did not include any of this in game. Working magic collations and murder holes can actually be built with creative use of trapdoors or leaving spaces between floor tiles, though they end up uh, comically oversized. The crenellated walls that are in game are simply a case of misuse of the term as they have nothing in common with the real thing. Don't get me wrong, this is not a rant. I'm not saying that devs at Funcom are incompetent or lazy. No. The point I'm trying to make is that Funcom decided to design their game around personal combat with no consideration for siege mechanics, and I believe that they would make the game better. The support beams I'm using here are also a modded item, but they are completely optional. I just don't like unsupported overhangs. A significant portion of the inner bailey will be occupied by the main keep. I've decided to divide it into two floors. First one four tiles high and second two tiles. Most of the interior will be taken by the great hall, while the upper floor will contain private chambers for the lord and roof access via a separate staircase.
After all, the roof is part of the battlements. I've chosen a very simple wall pattern with only a few windows at regular intervals on the two longer walls. Placement of the main keep was determined by the floor plan of this castle. I really wanted to build a nice vaulted ceiling for the Great Hall and can only do that on square foundations. This is just another example of long-reaching consequences of building this thing as a single object. Similar castle built on dry land would be made of freestanding buildings, which allows for greater versatility in the design. The hole in the floor leads to the secret underwater exit and the map room below. I need to build a shaft so that the elevator will move between my personal quarters and the basement. The staircase behind will lead only to the Lord's quarters. Roof access will be located on the other side of the great hall above the kitchen. When placing elevator in confined space like this, always make sure to rotate it correctly or you'll end up with the skull, that's used to call it, inside the wall. To make the elevator shaft a little bit less obvious, I've built another one, so that it's not an asymmetrical singular feature that immediately draws attention. And here's the aforementioned roof access. The room below will become the castle's kitchen. The little door in the corner is the main entrance to the cistern and one of the rooms under the gatekeep. One of the mandatory elements of the great hall is the fireplace, usually a very large and ornate one. I've decided to build one myself using some arches from arena set and large campfire, so that it not only serves as a decoration for the great hall, but also allows me to cook food. After finishing the walls and other minor details, I began work on the great hall's ceiling. Just like the cistern before, I've decided to build a quadripartite rib vault, using the vaulted ceiling inverted corner tiles from the arena set. The tile's name is a bit misleading or imprecise in this case. Basically, vaulted ceiling is a very broad term, more like a category, that contains a number of different designs. The common denominator is that they all use arches. So, the earliest and simplest form was a barrel vault, which is just a single arch linking two walls together. It was widely used in antiquity, mostly by Romans, but by no means became obsolete later. In a castle like this, it is a perfect choice for small tunnels, basements, etc. I used it here, for example in the little tunnel before the map room. As for the rib vaults, the whole area is divided into smaller rectangular units and the ribs are arches running along the edges or diagonally through the unit, dividing it into several parts. The names reflect how many bays are contained in each unit. So a sexpartite rib vault has three transverse and two diagonal ribs, which divide the space into six parts, while quadripartite has two transverse and two diagonal ribs, and only four bays. The later became one of the staples of Gothic architecture. Every single Gothic cathedral I've ever seen, and I've seen a lot of them, had this type of ceiling. Consider this a brief introduction to the wonderful world of vaulted ceilings, and believe me, it is a world worth exploring. So, imagine a horde of angry dudes ladder rushing your castle's walls. You have soldiers manning the battlements above them, you've got archers on the flanking towers, but wouldn't it be cool if your guys could shoot them in the backs as well? If the answer is yes, then you need to build yourself an Albarrana tower. It is a completely detached tower, standing some short distance away in front of the curtain wall and is only connected to it with a narrow bridge, which usually was constructed in a way that allowed its quick destruction to deny the enemy easy way in should they capture the tower. Albarrana towers were prominent in the defensive architecture of Al-Andalus, the part of Iberian Peninsula, modern day in Spain and Portugal, governed by the Muslims during Middle Ages. Of course, this is not really a well-known fact. Historians tend to focus on much more significant achievements, like saving Aristotle's work and reintroducing them to the Western world with the aid of Sephardic Jews who acted as intermediaries between the Muslim and Christian worlds. Of course, the Catholic West was so grateful that as soon as Spain returned to Christian rule, Isabella of Castile and Ferdinand of Aragon issued the Alhambra Decree, banishing Jews from the kingdom. The remaining Muslim were also forced to leave. 
As an alternative, they could convert to Christianity, and some did. But soon the reigning monarch's growing paranoia led to creation of the infamous Spanish Inquisition to battle the mostly imagined threat of the new converts practicing their old religions in secret. Of course, historians always argue about everything and there are other views on the origin of Spanish Inquisition. As a side note, Alhambra is a fortress rebuilt as a palace by Sultan of Granada Yusuf I in 1333. Today it's a UNESCO World Heritage Site and one of the most stunning examples of Islamic architecture and art in Europe. Well, at least for me it was a stunning masterpiece when I visited it a good 20 years ago. I've enlarged the walls of the inner bailey above the outer gate so that they provide height advantage over the gatehouse below. Then I've placed much collations on all the walls in the exact same way as I did before. The only thing that remains is to finish the inner bailey where I still need to fit the last two large gameplay required objects, the shrine and wheel of pain, and consider where to place the crafting stations. Of the many possible bailey buildings, stables make a lot of sense now, since we finally have mounts in game. Also, farrier will be required to care for them, which gives me an immersive excuse for placing crafting stations here as well. I want to keep the building open, so I've experimented a bit with different styles and materials. I started with the heaviest element, stone, barrel vaulted alcove near the wall. Then moved to much lighter quadripartite rib vaulted ceiling supported by columns. I maintained the same gradient on the sidewall, starting with full stone wall, then transferring to half stone half lattice. Front will be completely open. This will make it perfect for some NPCs and clutter later on. The last alcove is also empty, as that's the designated location for crafting stations. I've placed the Wheel of Pain right next to the stables. It looks a bit out of place, but should fit better after it's surrounded by crafting stations and clutter. Still, can't really ignore it as gameplay requires it. I've used fences to hide how thin the roof is, and added some rooftop pieces to draw attention away from this otherwise empty, flat area. I'm using reinforced wooden rooftops from base game, since Arena Set does not come with roof tiles. Finally, I've created this small elevated platform for the shrine, which not only is the last large structure required for gameplay, but also it hides the boring wall behind it. An important rule of castle design is to never leave the main gate visible and open to attack. For this reason I've made a very simple barbican. Its most important function was to block line of sight and direct approach to the gates in order to protect them from various siege machines. Also, it can be used offensively for counter-attacking without exposing the open gates to enemies. Of course, I'm mostly building it for aesthetic reasons. Like I mentioned before, passive defenses don't really work in this game. Anyway, that's it for part 1. Next time I'll show you what I did with the interiors and clutter. I hope you enjoyed this video and if that's the case, consider subscribing for more Conan Exiles content. Cheers!